Good afternoon. Oh. Uh, my name is Denise Jordan. I am the Chief of Staff of the City of Springfield. I serve under the Honorable Mayor Dominic J. Sarno. Um, actually, this for us, I'm going into my third year. It's election year for us. So in Springfield, um, this year is very significant because this is the year that we're going into a four-year term. So traditionally, the mayor runs every two years. So for us, it's kind of difficult because you have one year, and then the next year you spend running for re-election, so you're not sure whether or not you should start a new project, if you're not sure if you're going to be there the next year, so it's somewhat um, challenging. But for this year, having a four-year term, it gives the office of the mayor more stability and the ability to kind of look at more initiatives and really do a lot of long-term planning, um, because you figure you'll be there for a little bit. Um, I want to thank um, Janita for the invitation to travel to Connecticut to talk about Springfield, Massachusetts. I'm a lifelong resident, born and raised. Um, I love my city. As with any other city, we have a lot of urban challenges. Um, but you know what? We're really prepared for that challenge. And we're really trying to refocus Springfield and re-engage our folks. And I just got to meet the Dean Peters, Peters who is actually a graduate of Classical High School. That is no more. But that is also my alma mater. I graduated from Classical High School. Um, so it's good to have someone from Springfield um, in the audience. Um, what I'm going to do is, if, because of the size, I'm going to be very informal. That's okay. Um, and what we're going to do is just probably have conversation. I'm not really one to just do like straight lecture. You know, don't get me wrong. I can run my mouth if you let me. I can just talk, <laughs> whatever. Especially if I'm talking about my city. But um, one of the things that you know, talking about um, African Americans in the political process, I kind of like to know where folks think we are. You know what I mean? I want to know like where you think we are in the process, as opposed to just me giving my opinion, because that's really all I can do is give my opinion in terms of where I see African Americans in the political process. Um, a little bit about me in terms of background, because um, one of the questions I always get asked is, okay, you're the chief of staff, how did that happen? Not really sure how, other than the mayor called me one day after he was elected and said, um, Denise, um, listen, I got a question for you. Would you like to be my chief of staff? And initially my response was, um, let me get back to you. Because I didn't know really what that was. Um, and then I used the internet and I'm Googling chief of staff trying to find the job description so I could kind of see what I was getting myself into. Um, and really didn't have much luck. So it was kind of one of those baptism by fire things. You just show up and just try to figure it out. Um, I think I got the call on November 17th. And I actually started January, when did we start there? January 7th. January 7th. So between that um, like almost month and a half period, I couldn't really eat. <laughs> I was like breaking out. Like, can I do this? Like, what is the expectation? Didn't really get much assistance, couldn't find anyone to talk to to find out what is this that I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, tried to watch some um, old, -ish, uh, old um, episodes of The West Wing, <laughs> trying to figure out this chief of staff thing. What is it that this person does? Um, and what people would say is, you assist the mayor, you know, you stand in for the mayor, and you oversee the employees of the city of Springfield. How many employees is that? About 6,600. That includes police, fire, school, DPW. So now I'm like, all right, I'm very overwhelmed, you know, and trying to figure this thing out. Um, and I think for me, my first, I guess, the aha moment, like you can do this, is when I sat in on like a big meeting and I actually had something to contribute. Um, we, we have this thing called City Stat, and it's like a data driven management tool. And somehow workers comp came up. And I was like, oh, workers comp. Prior to my um, tenure as being a civil rights officer, I was a workers compensation manager for like 10 years with the state. So that was something that I knew. So I found myself kind of like running that little meeting and being able to really. So I think for people that didn't know me, um, it kind of was like, OK, she, she might know a little something. And so that was like the first little crack in terms of being accepted in that particular setting. Um, in terms of, you know, being comfortable in my city, thinking that I know a little bit about what we need and what our community are all about. Um, Springfield's comprised of 17 different neighborhoods, and uh, in totality, we have about 28 neighborhood councils and civic associations. 
that are very vocal and active and have a lot to say about who we are as a city. Um, being born and raised in Springfield, um, I'm a politician's kid, have always been raised in a household of public service. Um, as a child, always volunteered for everything, did the 25 mile walk for marches. Now, I did all that. Girl Scouts, um, organized little things, worked on different, I always volunteered. So, um, you know, in my volunteer efforts, you know, we have another mayoral aide in the office that accompanied me today, who is a, a Native American, Connecticut, right? Daryl Moss, who is a transplant to Springfield, so now we claim, claim him and we own him, so he belongs to us in Springfield, because uh, he defected from Connecticut and moved to Massachusetts. And that's where I met Daryl, volunteering. He had an open call to do some community service. I showed up, he showed up, we met, and now we're doing our service, um, and we're getting paid to, be, to serve, which is a wonderful thing. Um, being a person that has always volunteered, imagine how rewarding it is to like help people, because that's what I always did. Even as a kid, I always wanted to help people. So you get paid to help people. And so it's really an awesome thing. Um, with the exception of the last maybe three or four weeks, the snow calls, not cool. <laughs> not cool. That's just, that's why I'm happy to be here, because we're still getting you know, calls about snow plowing in our streets and things like that, but it comes with the job. Um, going into the position as chief of staff, I had a lot of reservations. And I think for most um, African American professionals sometimes, when you're in a venue where you, know, you sit in a room and a lot of the people or the majority of people don't look like you, you're not always comfortable in terms of how you're going to be viewed and how you're going to be taken, if you're going to be respected, and things like that. For me, I kind of felt at times I was questioning. Am I being ignored because I'm a person of color, or is it because I'm the only woman in the room? So I'm, I'm trying to figure out which one is it. And then at some point I determined that it doesn't make sense to spend the time trying to figure it out, because that's really not my issue. My issue is to come here and do what it is I'm supposed to do, and then just basically put my all and all, everything into whatever the situation is and people will maybe come around. And it's a difficult um, environment to be in, I think as a female first, because really city government is male dominated, oh, which is like a news flash, right? You know, <laughs> it's just, it, it's male dominated. So being like one of, at the time it was another woman, we were under receivership and we had a control board that was sent by the state to help oversee our fiscal and administrative um, operations. And you know, sometimes we would be in the room and. We would just be looking at each other like, you know, just as, as a form of solidarity because you're often so invisible. And I can just remember sometime when she may make a comment about, you know, something that she feels we should be doing. And the conversation would just keep rolling. And then when it would come up again, maybe five minutes later, out of the male's mouth, and it was comforting for her to see me in the room and vice versa because we could look at each other like, yeah, you did just say that. So you're not crazy, you said it, but somehow your voice was lost. So in 2008 is when we came in, right? It was 2008, 2007, 2007. It was a very important time for me, and it was an important time in the city of Springfield for the African American community. At that time, I felt like there was a lot of pride on my behalf, but also a lot of pressure because I was also the very first African-American chief of staff in the city's history. Um, again, when that information was <laughs> made available to me, it made me really nervous because I felt like there, were, there was now another set of expectations placed upon my shoulders, and I understood that I also had to basically represent all that that meant as a from a historical perspective and as a um, African American from my community, from the city of Springfield. And when you talk about African Americans in the political process, there are so many things that come with it. And as I spoke a little bit about being the child of a politician, one of the things that I realized and I knew very early, that when you are a politician in a minority community, and you are elected for a specific ward or a specific region, you're not limited there. 
even though that's your real scope, you end up representing people of color all over that district. And in other districts, you're gonna cross boards, you're gonna cross counties, because you're gonna become folks that look like you, you're gonna become their go-to person. And with that, there's a lot of expectations. Um, and a lot of things that people think you can do that you can't. Why? Because some of them are illegal. A lot of things that Daryl and I get, you know, it's like, oh, if you can't do all oh, your sellout, making me pay my excise tax. I'm like, I gotta pay my excise tax. You know, it's just little simple things like that that people think because you're in a position of what they could perceive as power, that you could just disobey the law. And because we're in a society where we have heard and seen a lot of elected officials that have broken the law or misused their positions of power um, for negative and personal gain and benefit, that some folks kind of think that that's what our political process is all about. Um, and just in terms of the history and the role that we play in terms of African Americans, or I like to say black folks, because we use the term African Americans, I personally always use black people because I feel African Americans sometimes excludes people um, of African descent that are not necessarily American. They're Caribbean folks, people that you know are, are just they're just black folks, and that's the term I use. So I'm going to probably interchange, but they're the same, okay? So I'm going to interchange the term. So, what is the party that the majority of African Americans belong to? Political party. Democrat. Democrat. And surprisingly enough, historically, we used to be a part of the Republican Party. Why? Lincoln. That was Lincoln's party. And then we switched, migrated from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Why? Because liberals and uh, conservatives kind of switched the whole rule, switched their bodies. Right. A little earlier than that, though. Roosevelt, the Depression. Roosevelt instituted a lot of social policies in, in, the, um, in the United States that really were policies that we felt could benefit us as a people, so we migrated. And one thing about African Americans in politics is that the African Americans um, in politics has always seemed to kind of be rooted in action and movement and causes. And so it's kind of hard to talk about African Americans in politics and not really talk about the relationship between the civil rights movement and the role that religion plays and politics for African Americans, and that in the civil rights era, that you know you always hear about a lot of the political um, struggles and the causes were birthed out of the churches, and then when you think about a lot of modern day um, African American politicians, most of those folks came out of the civil rights era. When you talk about your you know John Lewis, you know he was a part of the civil rights movement and worked in, alongside Dr. Martin Luther King. And so in the 60s, I think around that era, I think that's when African Americans really became engaged and really started to think about what it means to have political power in the United States of America. Um, and when you talk about um, power um, in African Americans in terms of how we look at ourselves in the political system, African Americans are the largest minority group in the political system, organized political system. And we represent the highest minority group in Congress. And so although we've seen significant growth in educational attainment and employment as a result of the civil rights area, we are still plagued by institutional racism, discrimination in housing, employment, health care, uh, the criminal justice system, and education, and this is largely contributed due to the lingering legacy of history of a slavery and racism. But when you speak about what our role is and the kind of impact that African American politicians have on um, the social agenda of the United States, you always talk about unquestionably that the civil rights uh, movement really motivated and encouraged a lot of African Americans to run for office. But when you talk about involvement in the political process, one of the things that you really have to look at is how that translates into power and what is power in terms of 
politics. Okay, so it's been said that African Americans have the largest number of representatives out of the minority population in Congress. But what does that translate into in terms of what kind of power that folks have to actually change the national agenda? How does their representation impact communities of color? Do they? Can they? And really, what does that mean? Because in order to be perceived as a group of players or as a person who has power, you have to know what it is. And power is the ability to make change and to have a voice that is heard and an audience that is listening. In order to make change, you have to have people standing with you, working for your cause, and supporting your effort. So in government, um, pretty plain and simple, that means you have to have votes and support. And that translates in terms of how you as a person can get all the members in the House to support whatever initiative that you're trying to bring forth. And so I think when you break that down on a national level, oftentimes it's different for a black politician to really be able to make headway if you are on a, if you're the minority on a majority board or council. Because at times, folks, if you talk to them, they feel like the Lone Ranger. So it's kind of difficult to try to serve two masters because it's like, here you are as the counselor or the representative or the senator of color, and you're on a board, and you have to serve the interest of an entire constituency. But at the same time, as a person of color, there's an expected obligation to serve people of color as well. And how do you do both without disenfranchising the other, you know, the other parties, the other people? And so that's where you, you run into the, I guess, the issue of being looked at as, you're only for the black agenda. That's what white people are going to say. And then people of color are going to say, you're only for the white agenda. You don't do anything for us. So how do you find that balance? Can you ever find it? And sometimes are the expectations even realistic? Um, I think the biggest issue in terms of blacks in politics is looking for that sense of respect. And when you talk about respect, you kind of look at it in two different ways. Is when you are in a public setting or you're in a, uh, a forum where you're making decisions, you want to know if you're being taken seriously or if you're just being basically, um, um, patronized. Because you have to, they have to give you a seat at the table. And sometimes it's just it's a difficult, it's just a difficult place to be in because you're not really sure where you fit in. And when I think about the election of Barack Obama in 2008, so here you have Barack Obama, who was elected to the Oval Office as the first African American president of the United States. So for many people, President Obama's election was really um, the culmination of a series of civil rights victories. And so a lot of folks are saying, okay, now the dream has has been you know, realized, or has it? Because here we have the President of the United States, and we see that he's still being victimized by racism. And so a lot of folks thought, well, if you're the President, you're going to be immune to racism. And what we saw very quickly, not just during the campaign, but even after the President was elected, you all will probably remember there were a number of emails that were circulating in the White House coming from staffers of Republican elected officials. And the folks were identified. And whatever the punishments were, they were kind of swept under the rug and they weren't really taking that seriously. A number of commentators also spoke about in terms of the treatment of President Obama. I don't recall personally ever hearing President Clinton, Bush, I don't want to keep saying all the presents I can go back to, um, <laughs> referred to as Mr. And I, you know, I can listen to the news on any given day and hear reporters talk about Mr. Obama instead of referring to him as President Obama. 
So for some of us, it, it kind of boils down to a respect factor. I've never heard of a reporter talk about Mr. Bush or Mr. Clinton. Not when they were the president. You're the president of the United States, and with that comes a certain level of reverence that's supposed to be really extended to all that hold that office. And so even when you start talking about um, the role and, and the treatment of African Americans in the political system, there's still institutional racism there. And what we find is that the president is not even immune from it. So I have a series of questions. Like I said, I didn't want to kind of like lecture. I just kind of want to set a tone and throw some of my opinions out. Because it's not really, I, well, I like to be interactive. So my questions really are for you. So I'm going to, now I'm going to turn the tables. So when we talk about African Americans in the political movement, and I mentioned how civil rights played a large part in it, and we talk about Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and how a lot of the efforts were, came out of the church, and when we had sit-ins and boycotts and marches. And in order to do that, you had to mobilize people. Someone had to show strong leadership and have enough power to get everybody to make sacrifices to join their cause and to fight their fight. Do you all think in 2010 or 2011 that any of us could get behind someone that we would be willing to risk our lives to fight or sacrifice for a cause that has an effect on human beings and the social agenda of the United States? Would anybody be willing to fight that fight? about this meat generation and we're now in a society where people don't even know their neighbors or don't even speak to their neighbors anymore and we know that back in the 60s I think and our parents would talk about our grandparents how there were more communal relationships just among human beings period so even if you had that char char charismatic person who had the cause and you know it in your heart of hearts this is what we should be doing do you think that a lot of folks would come out of their comfort zones to risk their own lives for a cause that's going to benefit other people. Because that's what the civil rights struggle was all about. It wasn't just people of color that were a part of the civil rights movement. People were risking um, death, being ostracized from family members, peers, losing their jobs, being jailed, beaten. For a cause for some people that they couldn't understand, like, this isn't your fight. Why are you a part of the civil rights movement? You're Caucasian. But yet we know that we have brothers and sisters of all creeds, colors, and backgrounds that were part of the civil rights movement. As a country, have we lost that? What do you think? I think the social culture itself is different. Absolutely. The social culture absolutely is different. So. Back in the day, when they wanted to promote change, they had marches, sit-ins, and boycotts. Do you think those tactics would work in 2011? Yeah, we have Facebook. We have groups. Facebook. <laughs> the, the whole, the whole unison of it isn't the same anymore. Because like you explained, everybody is more personal. Like you, you don't even go outside anymore. You don't see, you see kids riding bikes. Absolutely. Let alone having, you know, People discuss what they feel is right and wrong. It doesn't go on anymore. People don't even trust the person next to them, let alone somebody else having their life in their hands. So, as an African American, who are our black leaders? I mean, you, you really have to put your, your hands up. It's, a, it's, it's people that are in place that we're supposed to say are leaders. But then when you, once you go down the line, you know, Obama not getting the respect he deserves, then you have, you know, like, um, the, 
Reverend Jesse Jackson and his antics, and then you can talk about you know everybody else that falls basically down after that. I mean, who do you really, who can you really look to besides Martin Luther King, the person who's not even here anymore, mm -hmm. and compare those people? To? It's it's kind of like non-existent, and that's you know it's kind of like depressing at the same time as being a, you know African American in the community because I can't even sit here and say well that, that person right there is okay. I can I can look towards him for a change. And on the flip side to it, I never recall hearing about white leadership. Yeah, I, I think it's difficult today, especially with information. Um, I grew up, my heroes, some of them were a person like Urban King, but also Muhammad Ali, there were sports figures. But I think now it's so difficult because of all the information, the good and bad, the, the, we lack leadership. I mean, even if you ask the white person, who are your leaders, I don't know if they would come up with. So it's, it's uh, we live in a different society. And it's, it's uh, you know, I think there's the lack of, and I'm not saying religion, but spirituality, that common thread that we have with each other. We, there's so much into it, why we're such a me generation now. And, and I think that's the main thing. So it's like, when I got the, the topic, and it started talking about, um, you know, African Americans in the political process, one of the things is, you know, when you talk about black leadership, I've always questioned who defines black leadership? Who selects these folks? No one, I didn't vote. No one asked me, do you think this person can be considered a black leader? So it's like, you know, sometimes folks are self-appointed and they just somehow get people to follow them. Sometimes um, the mainstream dictates to us who our leaders are and we didn't have any role in that decision. And then I think about two people, because if you're going to think of anyone right now, people would probably, just because they don't have anyone else to say, they're going to say, Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson. But if you look at those two gentlemen, it's not to criticize them, do they really still have relevance in the black community on a global level? I'd like to say, with the election of Barack Obama, I think it proved that Americans, both black and white, were actually looking for leadership. Um, an individual with character, integrity, um, spiritual presence, the ability to create a shared vision and get buy-in. When you look at the numbers nationwide in terms of how he did politically for a black man running for president, it just goes to show people are looking for leadership. I think there are folks in the community um, throughout the country who are actually, how can I say this? I think when opportunity prepares itself and folks have that chance to be exposed to someone who Stands like a Barack or Martin or Malcolm or John F. Kennedy. I think folks will, will follow them. When I look at Farrakhan's March on Washington, when you look at the number of people who turned out, you still show that folks are looking for leadership. However, I, I, I agree with them. When you talk about the shifting of values, when you talk about the influence of pop culture, when you talk about that whole me generation, I mean, limiting, stifling creativity with you know the elimination of arts. In music in the school system. I think a lot of that has a lot to do with in terms of how we perceive um, leadership. Um, it messes with our ability to analyze leadership effectively. You know, and puts a lot of what we value culturally in question as well. And I think all that has to do with who we see as leadership type individuals. Just a poll of, of you know of you all. What do you think leadership is? Shame to say I'm not that well versed in politics, but I think because we we don't have that larger community, we look closer in. So in leadership, I look for leadership in my job. I look for people to lead me here, and what I look for, I I look for someone who has integrity, who is thoughtful, who is uh, logical which those were three things that drew me so to Barack Obama because I was very tired of having this man who I didn't have any respect for out representing me in the world, speaking, you know, <laughs> terribly and all that kind of stuff. So I think that I think that on a global level, I don't know how many of us really look that far out into the world beyond our our own space. And I don't know how good or bad that is, but I think it's I think it's fairly real. 
And I think the perspective that you just raised, I think it, it really speaks to, I think, how a lot of us are feeling that we're so far removed in terms of what's going on nationally because we're really just concentrating on what's in front of us. And if you don't see or really value local leadership, you know, and these are the people that you supposedly can kind of feel in touch, you're not even thinking about people that are in Washington because they just, you don't have a connection with those folks. And it's like, you know, being from the city of Springfield and just looking at, you know, the, the um, election results. You know, we have 80,000 registered voters in the city of Springfield. And we get like less than 12% of a turnout. Which means people are just like, we don't even care about what happens. And when we've gone in and we've talked to people, you know, well, how come you don't vote? They're like, for what? Because they look at the state of the country, we're in a recession, and they don't see how it's gonna really, like, how does my vote count? You know, what is my voting gonna do for me as an individual? How is that gonna help my family? I'm not working, what am I voting for? You know? So there's like voter apathy all across the country. You know, where you have certain, um, districts where you have 8,000 voters and someone's winning an, winning an election with 1,800 votes. So look at the thousands of people that didn't even bother. And so what do you think you're gonna get from an elected official that realized half this district is asleep and don't, they don't care? I don't think you're gonna get that much leadership. And I think that's indicative all across the country because people just don't really believe in the political system like they used to because they don't see the benefits. And I think it's like you said, we're so socially removed from one another that we're not willing to fight the fight for each other or to look at how we all can you know, benefit by you know, jumping on the train for a specific social cause. I have a question about the coalition with uh, uh, black folks and Latino and Hispanic folks in Springfield, how, how's that working? Because around here we have, even in education, the slice of the pie is pretty small, so right. we end up fighting with each other. And so I don't see a, a strong coalition. It seemed like it would be a national partnership, but I don't think we have it here. I was wondering in the city of Springfield, which is, has a high population of Latinos. Yeah. I think with the, if you go back historically, specifically again to the 60s and 70s, um, blacks and Latinos were always socially aligned with one another. And what happened is, as the Latino population emerged, they decided to kind of split off and become their own, um, their own organizations. Like in, um, in Massachusetts, we had the um, Black Caucus. And then I think um, probably in the late 80s, early 90s, there were, no, I think it was the 90s, 90s actually, early 90s, you had about three or four Latino elected officials who basically pulled out and then they started the Latino caucus. So there was a little dissension between both ethnic groups because the black politicians felt like we opened the door and invited you in. And now that we're having, the numbers are increasing and we could really have more effectiveness because our numbers collectively are growing larger, the Latino population felt like we don't need to be a part of your organization now because we have our own numbers. So now it's like, you have two minority parties kind of fighting for like that same pie, instead of saying, you know, how do we combine our efforts and work together as a group? And historically, African Americans, that's kind of like the way we always worked. We kind of opened the doors for all minorities and say, you know what, just join, you can join in with us. So uh, if you use the state of California uh, for an example, they had a big, uh, a big issue, a political issue about five years ago. I think it was, um, the district belonged to, I think it was Congresswoman Brathwaite. Um, but in, that, in this particular part of California, the Latino population just like quadrupled. And so for years, they always had an African American woman who represented them in that district. And so it, beca it became a race war because here this woman felt like she should have some kind of reverence and allegiance for all the work that she had done over the years with the Latino community. The Latino community basically was like, wait a minute, we're the majority here, we want our own to represent us, thanks for all you've done, but no thank you. So it caused tension. And so that's kind of indicative all across the country in terms of when you have emerging um, minority populations and you know, those folks wanting to have a voice and have a seat at the table. 
Um, but you know, one of the things is is that you know I've been in rooms with conversations when you want and you talk about you know Latino and Black politics. It's that's not a good room to be in because it's very emotional. It can be at times volatile, and people have very strong feelings and hurt feelings in terms of what the, they feel the treatment is and the lack of respect and reverence. You know, and I mean to be really kind of blunt, I was in a room and the conversation got so deep that African American, you know, politicians like, you know, just kind of turned on a Latino politician and said, you know what, I remember bringing you to your first meeting. And now you're, you know, you're being disrespectful and you're shutting the door on us. And then the exchange got so heated that one person stood up and said, you know what, at the end of the day, I don't remember seeing any of your people swinging from any trees. That's deep. And it goes back to the civil rights movement. You know, and people feel like, you know, black people fought for the right for all minorities to be treated with respect in America and then to be disrespected by other minority groups. Some folks, especially the older they are, they just can't comprehend that treatment. They feel it's the utmost disrespect. But then on the other side of it, people want their place at the table. And so how do you deal with that when you're both fighting really for scraps? Any thoughts on that? Just, this isn't just a white black thing, because even within the black community, I mean, Spike Lee's School Days, I love the, the movie because even within just black folks, we, we discriminate based on income, based on, on hair texture, based on skin color. So it's, you know, we have that same fighting. At some point, we have to realize, you know, you know what's the common agenda? What's the real agenda items? And how can we move forward? And, um, and I think that's one of the reasons we're so fractured. There, even today, I think. You know, I'm 53, but in this late 60s, you know, black folks were black folks, and now I don't think there's a common threat. And, th and that's good in one way. Mm -hmm. There's diversity within all our communities, but we have to come together, you know, whether it's all people of color or, or all people, low income people, whatever, and fight for common agendas. We're, we're not, I don't sense that, along with the lack of the spirituality, I don't sense the, those common threads. And, you know, you're hoping that President Obama would. Well, I want to do some of that, and I think some of it has happened, but the momentum has been, is, is lost a little bit. And, and, and you know what it was? I think it, for a lot of folks, um, specifically people of color, President Obama's election was not a realistic expectation. Because you had, literally, you had people of color thinking, oh, once he's elected, we're all going to get jobs. And it, I mean, it was like he was black Jesus. You know what I mean? And people really were feeling like that. And so they were disappointed immediately because you, I mean, when you talk about people that are not a part of the political process, people that just, they went out and voted sometime, people in their 40s and 50s for the first time were voting because they looked at this person who looked like them and had the opportunity, the chance to make history. They thought that his, uh, you know, his being elected was going to benefit people of color like immediately. But I don't think they thought he was going to do it when you look at large number of white society that actually mm -hmm. voted for Barack Obama. People were operating under the assumption yeah. that racial perspectives had changed when in reality mm -hmm. they really have. Right. When you talked about when you talked about the division between blacks and Latinos, when you look at the things that they fight over, it's just it's all about quality of life issues and access to opportunities. It's about access to jobs, education, social supports. And we, which means, like you said, we're still fighting over scraps. Mm -hmm. You talk about the interdivision in the black community to do with, um, with the various social status within our community. It's all about the same thing. And a lot, a lot of that, the root cause still brings us back to racism. And I think that's like the elephant that's in the room. Even when you're a room full of nothing but African Americans or, Af or Latinos, it's kind of like no one wants to talk about racism and the impact 
and the thought process, you know, in white America, mainstream America, it's like we have poor whites who refuse to identify with poor right. blacks and poor Latinos. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is America, pop culture has us all proclaiming our middle class status, when in reality, we're not. When I was a kid, they talked about blue collar, no collar. Now everybody's middle class, and the reality is we're still dealing with poor quality of life issues. When you bring it back to leadership, I think folks can galvanize and get behind anyone who is gonna push for social change to you know, enhance the quality of life of regular Americans. So we have to get back and talk about racism at some point. I think though, what a key issue in this is what you have said you gave the definition of what power is, and your last portion was two people that are listening. And I think to me, that's like a huge, I can't obviously speak for the African American experience, but, <laughs> <laughs> but so like for example, I'm Irish Catholic. Okay, so my family is like JFK, you know, we're Democrats. My grandfather was from Northern Ireland and he was Catholic and he was totally different thing. But I'm a woman. <laughs> and before I came to Thomas, I had a career in New York City in finance. And I would sit in meetings and I would make points, like you had said, with your colleague, where, oh, okay, and then someone else <laughs> would bring it up, same thing. Or I'd make a point and we discuss it and I'd leave the room and I'd be told, Good job, little lady. Good job, young lady. Like, what? <laughs> so I think people, I can't speak for African Americans, but I can speak for women who are professional. I think sometimes people take for granted the history of the people that came before you mm -hmm. and the struggles that they fought for you. I mean, for me, right, I, I think for a lot of people, they have to really think like, What's in it for me now? Is what I have good enough? Is my quality of life good enough for me to take it to the next level? And I think also it depends on where the individual person is. When I was in college, maybe I would have little, fought a little harder right now. I'm a mom. So it kind of changes the stakes a little. But I think really the change in society, the cultural change where really it's like it's young kids, younger people, I think, they have so much coming out that doesn't even really, if they, they don't really seem to sit down and think about the deeper, deeper implications of a lot of like, the media that's being thrown at them. 24 seven, these kids have Facebook, they have 12 different kinds of MTV, they have you know, just so much coming at them, and I don't really think that people, I think they take for granted that really there's a lot more change that can happen. And I think you know, the erosion of, of social responsibility I think plays a large part in terms of, I think, all cultures, in terms of where they think they fit in politically, if they even want to. I mean, you know, even though I think, in a way, I'm kind of veering off the, you know, the subject is really supposed to be about, um, you know, African Americans and the political process. But I mean, when you really talk about the political process, you want to see where everyone is. You know what I mean? And, and for African Americans, you know, even in our own community, you know, and Daryl and I talk about this a lot, because we're in City Hall. And so every year when it's time for folks to run for office, we're like, who can run? Who should run? And, you, and so you're thinking about all those things that people look at in the president. You want someone that has integrity, someone that really cares. Because in this generation, what I see, people run for office to make names for themselves. Do they really care about helping people? Because you know, when you talk about people, you just spoke about John F. Kennedy as an Irish Catholic, right? Members in my family would talk about him the same way you just did, as African Americans. And we talk about a lot of times in the 60s, you know, you go over to relatives, there's Martin Luther King and John Kennedy on the wall in an African American <laughs> household, right? You know, when Ted Kennedy died, you would have thought, you know, I was mourning him like he was my personal uncle, you know, because that's just the reverence that African Americans have for the Kennedy family because of their, you know, they didn't just talk about social change, they, they demonstrated it. You know, and there were African Americans who would say, I know what the Kennedy family did for, for me or for my, you know, or for black people. So it wasn't just, you know, really that symbolic, I think. Um, and not just in Massachusetts, you know. So there's something to be said about legacy. But when you talk about the new era politician, you know, you talk about this like me generation thing, and, and we talk about it on a local level. They're stepping stones for other people. Like we've seen folks run for office, they do a term or two, the next day you know they have a six-figure job somewhere else. You think about and evaluate the performance, 
And it's like, do you really care about people? And then when we talk about, I don't know, when we, we talk about people that we have talked about, like, this person would be an excellent politician. This person would represent us. They would do this and do that. When you talk to them, they want no parts of it. Why? The negative campaigning. You know, they tear your family apart. The lies, the corruption. You know, and it's like, why would I leave my comfortable nine to five to subject my entire family to a bunch of mess? So our, the political system has been corrupted so bad that good people are no longer interested in being a part of it. And that is sad and unfortunate. As great as Martin Luther King was, if he was today, he couldn't have been as effective because of mm -hmm. all the dirt and whatever. I look for empathy. I, that's why I love President Obama, because I think he's a man. He has great, tremendous empathy. I think the one of the greatest communicators, and who really speaks for the entire country on a lot of issues, is someone like Oprah. Because she's such a, I think she has a lot of empathy. I think people see that in her, that she's real. So that idea of being real, being an effective communicator, um, and having true empathy. Uh, and it's, like you said, there are a lot of good people out there that don't, they don't want a part of this because it's, it's too harsh, that life. Uh, you're going to be picked apart. Everyone has skeletons. That's right. And, uh, it's tough. But I mean, you hit it. Basically, the people want someone that's, uh, that has empathy which is why we elected Barack. But look at all the hell they're giving them in the house. They don't want a person in there that really cares about helping people and fixing stuff. You know, a lot of folks are there, they want to protect their own personal interests, make sure their friends keep making all that money, all at the expense of Americans. I mean, when you talk about the kind of society that we've come in, the political structure that we've made, look at Enron. What would make a human being, a group of human beings do that? When you're like taking people's hard earned their pensions, their children's college money, just so you, and you're building, I mean, who does that with a conscience? How do you look at yourself? And there's so many people like that. Look at Bernie Madoff. He had more than enough money. And you just, you just ruin people. People are committing suicide. You know, like, who, well, you want to be that kind of monster? And then on certain degrees, there are so many people that are like that. And what's unfortunate is that as the, as the American public, we see these folks play themselves out but we keep electing them, and we keep supporting them. And then when you get people in office that have a conscience and that who cares, they get beat to death by their colleagues. And I mean, I can speak to that personally because they're not, that's, our boss is like that. And oftentimes we kind of say like, I mean, come on, you gotta, it's not his nature. He is generally a people person, cares about people. That, he, that gets him thinking and caring about people gets in the way of a lot of his colleagues' political agenda. And it's always amazing to us, like, it makes us question, why are they here? Because he's fighting for the people. And so with the rest of these folks, what are they here for? And so we've really gotten away from that, see? Now, I was gonna say, even in terms of why when you think about you and I, in terms of why we even took the position working with the mayor of the city of Springfield, it's because of his active role prior to becoming mayor, if you're thinking about running for mayor, we talk about, you talk about who votes to look for or mm -hmm. vote for in terms of leadership. He is a good man. And it's like, I know I took, I, you know, I was working with myself. I took that position because he's a good guy to work for. He has character. He has integrity. He's the type of person that will show up for your grandmother's funeral and stay the whole time. Um, he'll grant you access to his office, whereas at one point in Springfield, you could not gain access to the mayor's office. Now it's like, you have full 100% access. When we started, even for the folks in City Hall, just to tell you, you know, the type of political leader he is. There were folks who had worked at City Hall for over 20 years that had never seen the inside of the mayor's office, ever. And they worked, you know, one office over. So it, it's, it's just kind of crazy when we talk about leadership. You know, even for the African-American community, the last election, he ran against a very, very, very popular African-American candidate for mayor. And a strong percentage of our community still voted for him because when he speaks, he speaks with integrity. Um, he's a man of action. He gets out to all the neighborhoods. If there's gang shootings in the neighborhood. He's the first one there. As Even though we tell him not to go out there. <laughs> you know, it doesn't bother him because as far as he's concerned, this is somebody's son who was just murdered. This is somebody's son walking around with a gun. So he's out there knocking on doors, talking with the people. And it's very rare that you come across someone who runs for a political office 
willing to put himself on the line, yeah. works 40 hours a day, you know, 20 it's, hours it's, a day. It's, it's actually, same. it's weird. Yeah. It's weird, but it's, and, and this is not an endorsement because you guys can't vote for him anyway. Right. You know, but it's just for us, we kind of talk about like, it's, it. It shouldn't be so weird. But it really is weird to see an elected official that like really still cares about people because even us, we're like, you know what, let it go. But whether this a person is a gangbanger or not, he will carry it all day till it gets on our nerves because someone was murdered. And you know, because he's just like, man, that person's wonderful. Who does that? You know what I mean? And so then you kind of think what it would be like if we had more people run for office that really cared. And then you think about the barriers that have been put before those folks in terms of why they won't run. You know, because it's like, even for me, I kind of think sometimes, oh, I, I hope the president doesn't run for another term. Because you kind of think about, you know, as a, as a person of color, you just think about his safety. You know, and then some of the things that you hear about, even during his campaign, no candidate has ever had to have that much security running for president. You know, and when you hit here in 2011, you know, you have uh, congressmen and senators on a national platform that would just make racist comments to the public and not care. And there's no repercussions for it. And people hear it, you know. And I personally, as a woman, I, I won't even talk about Sarah Palin, like, really? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, you know, I, I remember having a spirited conversation with a, a woman who was a prominent woman in the Republican Party. And I said to her stress, and you know what? If Sarah Palin was black, you would tear her to pieces. You are a party loyalist, and I commend you for that. Because there's, I know her. We get, we talk about politics all the time. And if Sarah Palin was a black woman or a Latina, she would be tearing her up. So just the excuses, she, and she couldn't even really respond to me because she knew I was right because she knows I know her. I'm like, she's an idiot, <laughs> you know? Just what? And I might be offending someone. This is just my personal thought, you know, because just some of the things, I'm like, who, said, who can say that? So you think about, you know, and Daryl talked about it, you can't get away from the racism of a lot of things. And some of it is just ingrained in folks. People have racist tendencies and don't even know how or why. They don't even know where they come from. You know, for me, before I got to City Hall, I was a civil rights officer for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And, you know, before I got the call from the mayor, I used to talk to Daryl a lot how I was getting really frustrated in my job. Because here I am. I'm supposed to be protecting the, uh, the rights of protected class members. And it's not just people of color. My job was to protect women, veterans, people with disabilities, and people of color. And I was finding that I was always like just fighting to get people to do what was right. And I'm like, what's well, something's wrong with that? Because when you think about being racist or discriminating people or blocking people out of the system, do you ever realize that it takes work? I mean, you have to really put things together and cover your back and get people to join in with you on how to keep certain people out or to set people up and do bad things. That takes a lot of work. Just doing the right thing is easy. You know, it takes work to discriminate people against people if you're in the place of employment. You know, you, you know it's all like, how do people spend so much time thinking of how to hurt people? Because that's what you're doing. And how do we how do we get there? And this is historical. This isn't anything new. But at some point, you kind of think like, should people be tired? Tired of that? You know, just you know, let people do things on their own merit. And people should always say, why do we need you? Talking about my position. Why do we need to have civil rights officers, which is another word for affirmative action officers, you know, in 2000? And I would be like, why? Because of all the cases that come across my desk that are ridiculous to think of the lengths people go through to keep people out of jobs that most people don't even want. And I never could understand that. You know, so it's difficult. So I'm not like naive to the fact that institutional racism exists and there are still people that are not comfortable working with people that don't look like them. But one of the things is that isms are bubbling up amongst each other as well. You know, and so now you still have people white people, Latino people, Asian people, black people, that discriminate against people of their own race and culture just because of where they are so, um, in regards to their socioeconomic status. And that's not a good thing either. Because I'm going to thumb my nose up at you, Daryl, because 
you know, you're a poor, uneducated person of color. You're a black man. And I'm educated, so therefore I'm naturally better than you. But at the end of the day, if someone that's a racist comes by, they're not going to judge me for having a, a degree. They're going to see us both the same. Two black people, no work, keep moving. You know? So sometimes I think people that are discriminated oftentimes feel comfort in discriminating other people because it makes them feel a little bit better about themselves because at times, the, uh, I think just being you know, beat down so much, you feel empowered by beating somebody else up because you just can't take it anymore. So I mean, this I was telling Janita when I was like just trying to do some research just on this subject so I just wouldn't be like spewing all my own opinions. It was really deep because it took me so many places that I couldn't really stay on track just like I haven't done during this lecture. Because it's such an important conversation that when you just talk about politics in general, where are we as a people? Because I don't think too many people really strongly believe in the process like they used to. And how do we get there? And then the, the big question is how do we overcome it? You know, what cause is gonna socially unite us as a people? You know, and if we found that cause, like you were saying, if we found that cause, and there was one or two people that would say, we're going to lead the fight. And we're not, I'm not the leader. I'm going to co-lead with four other people from different races and have some women, and then we're going to be just diverse, right? Would people be willing to risk their necks and join that cause and really fight the good fight? I think about it all the time. Like, what I, would I do that? Like, would I be willing to, like, you know, like, march and get hosed and beat? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's a realistic question. You know, but I just, and I hear, like, a lot of young people, when you pose that kind of question to them, this is my favorite. Oh, I know if I was there, I wouldn't have been a slave. Like, slaves had choices. <laughs> That's my favorite. I wouldn't have been a slave. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, really, everybody that was signing up to be a slave, I don't think so. So it just kind of makes you wonder, like, what, you know, young people. I, I love to talk to young people because it kind of reminds me where they're not. And it gives me a perspective of what they need in terms of, you know, more education, in terms of our culture and who we are as a people. You know, and those are just things. And I, I really, I like to talk to them because what I find is that they like to be talked to. And when they kind of feel like they're dropping knowledge on you and you're sharing and exchanging information, you end up learning a lot from each other. And they are receptive to you. They may not agree with you, but at least they'll listen. But then it's like, how, how often do you take the time to even talk to them? You know? So that's the beauty of having interns in our office. Me and Daryl pick them with that, poor thing. I mean, we just make them think about all kinds. If you come back tomorrow, we want to know. But they're, they're inspired by the challenge. And we really learn a lot from them because you know, we've aged out. So we have to have some kind of connection to the young people, you know, just to, you know, to know where they're at. Because that, that dictates our future and where we're going as a people. So you always need to keep in touch with them. And for some of us, it's a little scary to think that those, these folks are our future. And I was working at AIC College in the evenings. I was terrified. Just, just talking to a lot of kids, and these are kids of all races. Because everybody's parents were doing all the thinking for them. The only thing they didn't do was come to class and take their test with them. And that was scary. You know, the helicopter mom, you heard about the helicopter parents? You know, we never went off that. Uh, one came with us for an interview to be an intern. And we went to interview the, uh, the kid, and the mother was coming in with her. We were like, ah, you can't go. This is her job and her interview. It, it was just amazing. Anything else?
so I think that's one of the number one reasons why I will never run for office. Because, I mean, Daryl and I will tell you, it's so frustrating to see good causes on the floor, but there's so many personal agendas that go into watering down a good decision, so it's just almost like, it's just ridiculous. Like, you know, all the slack that the president's been getting about health care. We all need health care. I mean, it's just like, really? So it's like, whose who's, um, proposal is going to be picked? We all need health care. And we've been battling about health care since way before President Obama. And it's all like, the closer we get, then something happens. And I always make a joke that because it's so personal and so agenda-driven politics, that I would say, Daryl could come up right now and say, I have the cure for cancer. All I need is for the city council to pass the you know, referendum so I can give the cure to all the medical people. Some people aren't going to vote for it because they don't like Daryl. I don't want Daryl getting that much credit for saving the world. They're not going to vote for it. How ridiculous is that? But to be honest with you, it can be that simple and that petty. And it, it's just, that's another thing that's so disheartening about it. You know, the whole, the, the unrealistic expectations of President Obama, really, we just, we got there in one year because George Bush was saving the world because he was such a great person and he didn't get us into this recession, but you're supposed to fix it in a month? That's not realistic. And he's been fighting since he got there. I don't think they fought that much in, con in Congress. Uh, I do see some hope though on the horizon. I do see a difference in younger people, some of the good, some of the bad. But I also look at someone like President Obama, I think his effect is, is, is still monumental, even though he's limited what he can do. I know for, um, for my two sons, having someone like him, it means so much to me. And I think with my, my mother, you know, she was crying during the um, ceremony because she thought of her grandkids, that they have someone to look up to. And I think that, you know, even a person like Oprah Winfrey, I mean, if people, white people and people of color can look up to these people. So I'm hoping, even though it's so tough today, we, we lack the family structure. You know, before I think of the black community, it was in the church, but we don't have that. But I still see some hope and, um, uh, you know, supporting people who have the vision like that. And uh, because once we give up hope, then we have absolutely nothing. I was, I was going to say, um, to add my perspective, how very simple. Response to your question. I think there's a lot being done. I know just by working on, on the local government scene, there's a lot that's being done that people just don't see. If you gauge um, effectiveness or gauge outcomes strictly by what you read in the newspaper or watch on television, you will never know. Every argument you have in one of the conference rooms or in some meeting, every time you change the system, I mean, I do a lot of stuff around the gang activity in the city of Springfield. Every conversation I have with the police department to change their viewpoints on young black and Latino men, this long-term change happens. It happens, and it's like there's a lot of structural changes that are being made that people just don't see. And if you gauge it by what you read and say Springfield Republican or Channel 22, you would think that all hell is happening and there's no change and no progress being made. But in reality, systematic change happens every day. So if I look at it from a global perspective, and I look at what Obama and his administration is doing, if we gauge it strictly by what we see on the Dave Letterman show, Jay Leno, or Fox News, we're going to assume that nothing is happening. And we'll assume that, you know, the majority of Americans have given up on Obama, but that's not the truth. If you go to your Facebook pages and you look at the status updates when people do comment on Obama, just type in Obama and see what people are saying. People do believe in it. There is change happening, and we have to convince ourselves that it's actually happening. I, I agree with them. We can't give up hope. But we do need to question the media. And if we see things being said or happening that we don't believe in, then we need to go after the advertisers. When we talk about the 60s and we talk about the change and we talk about the boycotts, unfortunately, we've given up on a lot of that. And we don't question anything anymore. I mean, this being an academic environment, we should be teaching students to be scholars and to question everything that happens, not just to memorize the information that's being shared. That's what's going on. And, and you know what? You, raised, you both raised good points because the thing about Obama and, and a lot of conversations that were happening, I think after like the first year, a lot of black folks are saying, well, you know what? In terms of all the negative feedback, they're not gonna let a black man fix this country. They're not gonna, you know, it's just not gonna happen. Because for every 
stride he makes, then that makes Bush look bad. And that makes Bush look guilty like he did something. Like, and so some people even felt like he was elected because the, the country was so jacked up. We might as well elect somebody black. The country is jacked up anyway. I mean, these are conversations that people were having. I'm not saying this, these are my thoughts, but I actually heard people say these things. Like, again, the social network, reading internet things that were being all over. Yeah, people are like, yeah, they figure since the country's jacked up right now, you might as well elect a person of color to do it. So now we can just dump on, it's all his fault. But to allow somebody of color to actually fix it, that's not me. Now, when you hear things like that, like, it sounds like ridiculous, but those are, those are real thoughts coming from people. Yeah, for people of color, for women, the old boy network, it does exist. It really does. I mean, just working in the city of Springfield, it does exist. Um, their folks are the first hired, everyone knows they're the first fired. It happens, and so when we talk about the systematic change that takes, that takes place on a daily basis, even in her capacity as chief of staff. It's like, when she's dealing with the department heads, those are some of the conversations that has to be had. When it boils down to leadership, real leadership stands up and face adversity. And they address those issues when it happens. You can't let it slide by. So when you talk about leadership, I think those are some of the things that people need to look at. Are you going to stand up and hold other folks accountable for their actions, their behaviors, and their thoughts? And you can't do it by yourself. You can try, but they always talk about strength in numbers, and that's where you, where unity comes into play. You know, but just every, you know, every now and then, just raising the issue kind of leaves thoughts in people's mind. Because for me, sometimes I say to Daryl, I can't really prove certain things, or I may not have a large impact. But for certain people, I just want them to know that I know where they're coming from, and that's satisfactory for me. Because I'm like, you're not as slick as you think you are. I, I, I know where you're at, and I'm just going to stay on you. I'm going to watch you. And eventually, you're going to expose yourself. And oftentimes, people always do. Because you get sloppy when you get comfortable. Well, aren't you losing now? Because I've seen people that are Just to get him into a public conversation with one of the state representatives. 
and we heard the whole yeah, entire that conversation was awful. on the voicemail. Yeah, and it was, and they were leaving a message right. for our communications director, so it was recorded. Okay, and then you're gonna say this. You know, then we'll, we'll get a resident, and we'll yeah. get them to say. I mean, this is the station manager <laughs> plotting this, key, and we're listening. So we call a meeting. We call the general manager over. Can we just press play? <laughs> Did you hear it? He was like, well, what are you going to do? We're just going to hold on to it. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> that was great. That was, I mean, really, and these people, you know, usually they're nice. And they're always like, oh, we love the mayor. Station manager. Like, really, I mean, it was like, it was crazy. Then we'll find this person. And then maybe we can get this person to say this. And then they were like thinking of a uh, politician that they know did not really you know, like the mayor. Oh, it was so, it was awful. And these are the people who shape the news. They shape your perceptions of the world. That's why sometimes you really have to stop and you have to question what you see here. That's why as educators, I think um, we spend a lot of time trying to teach students skills on how to determine what's, what's true, what's good, what has good resources and that kind of thing as far as, you know, books and journals and websites and, and all those kind of things because there are people who are never going to change. Right. You know, so we have to start with people coming up saying, you know, it's your obligation to be accountable and to determine what's true and what's not and all that kind of thing because your grandmother's still going to listen to Glenn Beck because he probably looks like a nice boy to her. You know, exactly. I mean, yeah. that's, exactly. and you know, and the people are still going to vote for Sarah Palin because she she's cute when she talks. And yeah. I mean, how many people do you know vote for somebody because they like the way they look? Or oh, yeah. they when like you this, look you presidential, know, they yeah, always that talk kind about of thing. that. So, looks presidential. And some of these are really very educated people too. Oh, but yeah. they just so I think our hope is to always be, especially in education, to be, you know, making students careful and and thoughtful about those kind of things. You know, that's our hope. I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to come and really share some dialogue with you. Um, and so whenever I come out and speak to folks, I learn a lot from you all. So some of the things that you all have said, I'll probably steal them and use them um, when I talk to other young people. You know, it's just we're borrowing knowledge and exchanging knowledge. So I want to thank um, Tunson's Community College for the invitation. Um, and thank you all for coming um, and just indulging me to share a little bit about my views on the world um, and talk a little bit about been about the state of Springfield, Massachusetts. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so thank you again, Denise, for coming all the way from Springfield and sharing some information with us. Um, Thursday at 11.30, your moss will be back um, to... Discuss the slave narratives. Yes. Grow, so discuss the, the, to discuss the slave narratives. It'll be in Founders Hall at 11.30, so if you want to see him again, um, on Thursday. If you're with Professor Kukis' class, I have a sign-in sheet for you. Um, please feel free to eat the refreshments in the back and